Turn in your Bible to 1 Samuel chapter 12 as we go through the book of Samuel. It's been really good. I don't know if you guys have enjoyed it as much as I do, but um, it's amazing to see the things that God has been bringing out uh, through Samuel, which means heard by God. We're in chapter 12. We've uh, seen the people receive a king, King Saul, their first king. They've rejected God, not Samuel, but they've rejected God, and they, and they have Saul. And then we see the enemy attack. The Ammonites come up in chapter 11. Nahash, we'll read about that in chapter 12, because Samuel gives the testimony of it. And they come and they find, uh, they want to find a helper. I don't know if you remember this story. It's kind of amazing. Uh, Nahash comes up and he says uh, that he'll make a covenant with them if he lets them put out their right eye. And they go, let us think about it. And that to me is, is almost sounds absurd that we're going to think about it. We're just going to let somebody put out our right eye. But really... Many times we let the devil, we let the world, we let other things put out our vision, put out our sight, and we go on blindly through life instead of listening and following what the Holy Spirit would lead us to do and being a lamp for God. So they, they end up uh, getting Saul, and Saul sends out this message to all the people, and they come and they get 330,000 soldiers, and they divide into three troops. Must have been three companies of about 110,000. They attacked and killed the Ammonites until the heat of the day. And then um, all the people that were against Saul being king, they, they were now all in unity when they see him leading them into victory. And so they're all behind the king now. And, and they made sacrifices and peace offering to the Lord. Um, and they rejoiced, and they celebrated that they had a king. They celebrated that God had given them victory. And then we pick up here in 12. Now Samuel said to all Israel, Indeed, I have heeded your voice in all that you said to me, and have made a king over you. And really, when you really look at this, Samuel didn't like the idea, if you remember the council. He was pretty irritated by it. He felt like they were forsaking him and ignoring him. And God said, they're not forsaking you, Samuel. They're forsaking me. See, because Samuel is the messenger. He's the prophet of God. But he represents God. And it's the same thing as we see it in our world today when we share Jesus with people. When we share the word of God with people and it falls on deaf ears. When we share and talk about Jesus and people just keep running and going and doing what they're doing and they don't want to live for God. They don't want to hear it. They act like they're okay and they're not. It's, it's not that they're forsaking the messenger. They're forsaking God. They're rejecting God's authority over them. They're rejecting the truth of the word of God. And Samuel got really upset about it a little bit until uh, uh, God spoke with him and counseled him. But he's saying to him, I've obeyed your voice. And he went back to God and, and, I, and we've made a king over you. Now he's not taking credit for it. He's just saying he was the messenger for God. And, and he's saying, indeed, I have done this. But he didn't really fully agree with it. In verse 2 he says, and now here is the king walking before you. Now it's almost as if he's waving his hand or pointing at him. He's living before you. And I am old and gray-headed. And, and look, my sons are with you. I have walked before you from my childhood to this day. Now again, he brings up the king. He talks about himself being old like he did in chapter 10. And then he said, my sons are with you. And if you remember, he tried to set his sons up to take over his ministry, to take over speaking with them and ruling over them and judging them. And if you remember, this was really the impetus. This is what started them asking for a king. They said, no, your sons are wicked. Now, Samuel was a great prophet of God, but it seems like 
He was a bad father. And we see that over and over in scripture. We see that over and over in life. That, that, that people can be a good man of God and then they fail miserably with their kids. Well, truthfully, kids have to make their own choice. You can train them in the way that they're supposed to go. And, and they take off and do what they want to do. They have a sin nature. But here's his boys and his boys are literally, they're evil. The people don't want to follow him. They're like sons of Bilal also. But he says, I tried to put them up before you to take over, and you asked for a king. And he says, so we gave it to you, but he's old, and he's, he's talking about, he's, he's already retired, really. Uh, I think that was chapter 10, wasn't it, that we've seen that? Oh, maybe it was chapter 9. My goodness. It was chapter 8. Now it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. Chapter 8. And it says, But his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain, took bribes, and perverted justice. And that was 1 Samuel 8, 3. I didn't realize we had went that far from that. So there's the testimony of his sons. And we're going to see now the testimony of Samuel and what he has done for so long. So he tried to put them. And he says I have walked before you. From my childhood to this day. Now he's talking about his life. Before them. Think about this. Remember Hannah. Lent him to the Lord. Samuel literally grew up in the temple. He literally grew up before Eli. And, the, and, the, and his sons. Who were sons of Belial. They were evil also. So he says I have walked before you. From my childhood to this day. They've seen him all of his life, his testimony of living for God, his testimony of serving God, his testimony. And, and you know what? This is one of the best testimonies that a person can ever have. I was born in the church. I came to know Jesus as a young child, and I've always been in the church, and I've always had the grace of God upon my life, and I've been serving God. But you have to come to the saving knowledge. You can't just be born in the church. You have to come to the saving knowledge and repent of your sin nature and come to Jesus and believe upon him like anybody. And we was at the men's events a few weeks ago, and it was funny. We were talking with this uh, the speaker, Chaz, and another person who was playing music the night before was talking about how his son was in the youth group at another church. And he's been raised in the church all of his life. And he's about 17 now. And he was like, wow, you know, I've been watching these guys that are in the Bible college and are coming in. And man, you really got to have a bad life in order to do this. And so I'm thinking this and that and that. And maybe I, and, and his dad's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You don't need to go out and make no testimony to be living for Jesus. And it was really funny. We we're talking about it. And I said, I said, yeah, tell him about Samuel. How Samuel was always in the church. And he looked at him and he goes, his name's Samuel. And so it was really funny to see that he had named this kid Samuel. And I said, well, go encourage him with this story. Because he doesn't have to go out and live a wrong life to be effective in the kingdom of God. And sometimes we think that you have to. Sometimes people get a little irritated and think, well, if you didn't go out and kill everybody like Saul of Tarsus, if you didn't go out and do this or that, and don't have a testimony of how you returned, you know, the greatest testimony is to walk before the Lord from childhood. He's been there the whole time from childhood. I think of Chuck Smith, Pastor Chuck, who God used to found the movement of Calvary Chapel. And his mom would read the scriptures to him while he was in the womb. And then he was dedicated to God from in the womb. And then as he grew up and learned to read, he learned to read in the Bible. And I don't know if you guys know his story, but when he was going to graduate and go to college, he was wanting to be a doctor. He never knew that his mom had dedicated him to be a, a minister of God. And he come home one day out of nowhere and just said, Mom, I changed my mind. I'm going to be a preacher. God had just visited him and said, you can be a doctor and you can help people physically and help their lives and you may heal, help heal some people. He says, but with the word of God, you can save their soul for eternity. 
And he came home and he became a preacher. And he never knew that his mom had dedicated. He never knew that from childhood he had been taught the Holy Scriptures. And that, and he'd been there and his walk had always been. And you know what I like to say? I, I don't know personally all of Chuck's walk, but I know he was faithful to God. And that his last sermon on a Wednesday night service, he preached about faith. And he went home, maybe it was a Sunday night, and he went home. And he ended up dying and going to be with the Lord. I shouldn't say dying because he's more alive now than he's ever been. But he walked before the Lord. And that's the testimony that you don't have to go out and live an evil life and then come and repent and get saved. You don't have to be a prodigal who runs away. You can be born from childhood and live in the church and be just as effective as anybody by teaching the scriptures. The problem is we start to look at the man instead of looking at the God who saves the man. We start to look at the man instead of looking at teaching the scriptures. People aren't saved because of teaching somebody's testimony. We do overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. We don't love our life to the death, but we overcome by the testimony by growing in our testimony. Growing and changing. Growing and listening to instruction so that we do not go astray from the words of life. We want to continue to learn the instruction of God and to be changed from glory to glory. And that's a great place to start. So he says, I have walked before you from my childhood to this day. Current testimony, right? Then he says in verse 3, here I am. Witness against me before the Lord, before his anointed, whose ox have I taken? Or whose donkey have I taken? Or whom have I cheated? Whom have I oppressed? Or from whose hand have I received any bribe which, which was to blind my eyes? I will restore it to you. Now, if you'll notice, listen to me, there's a few things here. First of all, notice that these are some of the things they accused his sons of. He wasn't given that example for his sons. And so he said, if I've done that, accuse me. They're accusing his sons, but he's not doing that. But notice this, he says first, and I'll come back to that point. Here am I. Do you remember where he said that? When his calling as a young boy living in the temple, serving Eli, serving the people. And remember he said, here I am, Eli. And he ran to Eli and he says, you called me? Three times. And Eli finally figured it out. He said, oh, God is speaking to him. He said, listen to me. This time when he says, when he says, Samuel, Samuel, say, here I am. And that's what he said originally at his calling. He learned to hear the voice of God and obey the voice of God. And, and so when he learned to hear the voice of God and he said, here I am. And he was available for God to do the work of God for the, for the glory of God. Then, then he learned not to do these things that his sons were doing. Look, he says, witness against me. Where's the evidence? Put me on trial. Have I... It, it, well, he says, put me on trial before the Lord, the Lord first, and his anointed, which would be the king, King Saul. Whose ox have I taken? Listen, he already told them that the king's going to take their oxes. The king's going to take their stuff. Look what he's saying. He, so, so not just his sons judging harshly and taking stuff and oppressing them and, and, and taking bribes, but the king's going to do these things. A king over them. God would never do this. A, a man of God, a prophet of God would never do this. The, the saint of God doesn't want to act like these things. These are characteristics that are bad. And he's saying, witness against me. Have I taken your ox? Have I taken your donkey? Who did I cheat? See, he hasn't cheated anybody. He's been a servant. He's saying the king's going to take these things. The king is going to take things and you're going to feel cheated. He says, but he's never done that. Whom have I oppressed? See, the king will oppress people. Or from whose hand have I received any bribe? The king will take bribes. His kids are probably taking bribes with which to blind my eyes. And that means just to turn your back. You know how you turn your eyes? I don't see that. We see it quite thoroughly in politics today. That's why government is so messed up. Is they take all this money for special interest. And then they vote 
to let this company do that or this group do that. And then they fight against this and fight against that. It has nothing to do with what God wants to do or what the people want. It has to do with special interest groups. I will restore it to you. So he doesn't just say, witness against me, testify. He says, but if it's happened, just bring and I'm going to repent. I'll restore it. I'll make it right on anything that's happened. And listen to me. These are not characteristics for the man of God. These are not characteristics that with the word of God is it corrects us would want us to do. We're not to take people's possessions. We're not to cheat people. We're not to oppress others. We're not to take bribes so that we can turn our eyes and become blind. See, we don't want our eyes put out like this, this Nahash was going to come and do. And when we turn from God's commandments, that's what happens. We become blind spiritually. And we should receive the restoration that Christ brings in these things. He cleans up our life. He restores it completely to us. So he's saying, make accusation. What do they say in verse 4? And they said, you have not cheated us or oppressed us, nor have you taken anything from any man's hand. And it's not, it's not only a great testimony that we see of Samuel from his childhood until now he's old and gray-headed, but it's also a good lesson for you and I to understand. Not to cheat, not to oppress, not to really take anything from people's hand, but to understand that God will always provide. These are not godly characteristics, and that God will always provide. Don't, don't worry about or don't try to, don't, don't, don't let man give you things and say, oh, look what they've done. They've made me who I am. Always know that your paycheck, always know that your provision, always know that everything you have comes from God. Even if he uses somebody else to give it to you, to provide for you, it was God who provides. I, I just want to think of a story, the story of Abraham is what I'm reminded of. When Abraham went to rescue his nephew Lot and saved the cities that were defeated of Sodom and Gomorrah, I believe it was. Um, and the kings that were defeated, he wouldn't take a reward at all because he did not want people to think that his riches came from these earthly kings. He wouldn't take anything from their hand. He said, just restore to these men who went with me. There's a couple guys that weren't his, that weren't his slaves. And, and, and he said, restore to them, but don't give me anything. You know? And so we need to be very careful because Men's gifts and things that men will hand us will turn our hearts away from following the Lord. So be very careful what kind of gifts you take. Notice this. Notice this. They couldn't find anything against him. They couldn't find anything. Remember how they couldn't find anything against Jesus? His character? And they had to make up lies. They had to find crooked people that would make it up. And that's the way you and I are supposed to try to live. See, before Jesus, we're perfectly righteous positionally. Practically, we want to attempt to do that in our lives, in our character. As we follow and are led by the Spirit and the Word of God and the character of God, we want to live in a way that our yes is yes and our no is no, and we don't cheat anybody. And if anybody ever recuses us of it, we want to make it so right. We want to restore it. We want to clean up that testimony so that they have no accusation to make against us. That's always what we want to do. We want to make sure that they would never be able to make an accusation against us. Then he said to them, the verse 5, The Lord is witness against you. And his anointed is witness this day that you have not found anything in my hand. And if you remember in the Old Testament, and even now I think it's good, it says, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, let a matter be established. And so there's Samuel. I think the king is there, Saul. And he's saying, before God and before the king, you have now witnessed that I've not done any of these things. So he's always provided. He's always given the word. He's always been walking righteously before them. And there's no accusation against him. 
And then he says that there's not anything found in my hand. You haven't found anything in my hand or in my life. See, his hand can represent his works. His hand can represent right there. His hands are empty. When we raise holy hands to God, we're raising empty hands to God and saying, fill my hands, Lord. Nothing should be in our hands in this life except for God's will, God's ways, God's words, and God's kingdom. We should be serving as men and women of God with nothing in our hands that belongs to anybody else. No agenda that belongs to anybody else except the Spirit of God and the Word of God and the ways of God for the kingdom of God, for the glory of God. So let me ask you right now, think about it, don't answer out loud. What is found in your hands today that God would not want to have there? See, because as we get bought by the blood of Jesus... Our hands are to be used for God's service now, for God's people. Not to oppress, not to cheat, not to do any of these things that he was up here. Not to take anything from anybody that is not ours. Uh, don't forget the laborer is worthy of his wages. There's a, there's a time there where God is providing wages for you. But to take things that aren't rightfully yours. Or to cheat or oppress. A take from man's hand as if you think man can help you some way. But it's God. We want to receive from God's hands. We want to receive from God's blessing. We want to remember that, that, that my God will provide for all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And our needs as a spiritual people in a spiritual kingdom are spiritual needs. God provides for the birds of the field. How will he not provide for his family, his children? Our needs are always going to be first and foremost spiritual. But the world wants us to focus on our physical needs first. The world wants us to put physical first. In fact, most people will compartmentalize their life and, and they might get up in the morning and pray. But then I got to go out into the physical world and everything's physical. And I just worship on Sunday. But I'm physical and I'm in the world all week long. But it's always a spiritual life. We're spiritual people in a spiritual kingdom. We're spiritual citizens of heaven. And we're only pilgrims down here. So the spirit has always got to be first. And we're no longer to regard anything as flesh. Anything. We know it's a spiritual kingdom. It's a spiritual war. It's a spiritual God we serve. It's a spirit that we follow. God's spirit in spirit and truth. So what is in our hands that we're trusting in that we think if I get more of that in my hands, I'll be better as opposed to focusing on empty hands held high for God's glory till God can fill us with his mission and we can serve his people so that they will see the kingdom of God in us. So he says he's innocent. That's what the final verse there says in verse 5. And they answered, he is witness. Innocent. Innocent. No fault, Samuel. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? That they couldn't find anything wrong with Samuel. That's pretty amazing. I know that before the throne, I'm like that. In position, in righteousness, I'm like that before my God. But I'm sure there's people that would say, well, you know what I seen him do? He was going faster than 55. You know what I seen him do? There's people that are always going to point and accuse. But in the beloved, I am secure. And I can get up and go out and give a witness of Jesus Christ because that's what I'm called to do. And that's why Christ took our punishment. That's why he took our sin. That's why he took the power of sin and the penalty of sin. So that we can be witnesses of his glory, of his kingdom, of his work. And we can be found with nothing in our hands except for the kingdom of God and the word of God. And the message that he called us to go out and serve with. And that's what we should do because of his righteousness, not because of ours. Verse 6, then Samuel said to the people, it is the Lord who raised up Moses and Aaron 
and who brought your fathers up from the land of Egypt. Now notice this. This is a testimony that Samuel's given. He wants them to see the testimony of what they're giving up. See, they're choosing a king to deliver them. And he's saying, listen, remember, be reminded of the, the, the armies of Egypt. When the children of Israel cried out because they were in bondage. And who was it then? It wasn't King Saul. It wasn't any earthly king that rescued them. But he said to the people, it, it is the Lord who raised up Moses and Aaron. Remember the brothers? And Moses tried to rescue them. Much like a king would. Moses means one drawled out. Remember he was drawn out of the Nile. But Moses tried to rescue him. And what happened? He, tried to, he killed one Egyptian. And had to flee from Pharaoh. And be 40 years in the wilderness. But then when he came. Listening to the voice of God. Followed the instruction of God. In the way of God. Living a life for God. God delivered and defeated the entire nation of Egypt and killed Pharaoh and all of his armies in the Red Sea. Just when he listened, just when he obeyed, just when his focus was on trusting in God and not in an earthly king. Just when all he had in his hand was, remember, he had the rod of God in his hand and he listened to God. And then he was able to deliver but it was God who raised him up. It was God who did the delivering. It was God who brought their fathers out of Egypt. To you and I, we look back and he brought us out of the world. Because Egypt is always a type of the world. Pharaoh's a type of the devil. See, God has saved us from the power of the devil. He saved us from the penalty and the power of sin. He saved us out of the world. He called us out of the world. And yet we have our hands full of the world. Our hearts full of the world. Our minds full of the world. Our houses full of the world. And God has called us out. To be separate. And to testify to the world. But notice who he, what he says. It was the Lord who raised up Moses and Aaron. It's God who raises up leaders. It's God who calls out his chosen ones. It's God who does this. And you know, he does raise up deliverers. They're types of Christ, and they, they are leaders that come and lead people in places. He raises up, not man. When you see man raising up, you'll see a man's institution. But when we surrender to the work of God, he raises up leaders. And when we reject the leaders, we're rejecting God. God raises up deliverers. He, it's always his provision. Think about it. With Moses, he was the provision of God to lead the children out. He's a type of Christ. Even when he died, he said that there'll be a prophet rise like him. And in him, in as many as listen to him will be saved. And he was talking about it in Deuteronomy 19, I think 1970. He was talking about Jesus years later. Everybody thought, and all, all the nation of Israel thought it was Joshua. And it's interesting because Joshua is the Hebrew Jesus. And it means the Lord is salvation. But he was always talking about after him coming, Jesus. But it was looking forward to the New Testament. So he says, though, the Lord who raised up Moses and Aaron. Do you know that the Lord will always raise up provision in your life? He's always going to provide. And if you look to him and ask him and look for him and trust in him, he will bring provision for the problems. He'll bring provision for your household. He'll bring provision to lead you out of places you shouldn't be. He'll always bring and raise up a way out of the situation you're in. And that's the point that Samuel's trying to get across to them. A king will fail you. A king will take from you. A king will oppress you. A king will cheat you. A king is going to do everything because he's earthly. And yet God is the mighty deliverer who raises up people to protect you and help you and counsel you and take care of you. And then he says in 7, Now therefore stand still. 
That's what we're called to do in the body of Christ is to stand still. That I may reason with you before the Lord concerning all the righteous acts of the Lord which he did to you and your fathers. Isn't that amazing? Stand still that I may reason with you. God says, come to me and reason with me. Though your sins were as scarlet, they can be white as snow. Stand still and seek counsel. Reason with the word of God. Reason with God. Reason with godly men. Reason about every problem that comes into your life. And wait upon the Lord. Stand still. And he will raise up a way out. He will raise up a deliverer. He will raise up provision. If we will wait and trust him. But we have to be willing to wait. But what's he testifying about? What's he telling them to stand still? Concerning all the righteous acts of the Lord, right? Which he did to you and to your fathers. Isn't this amazing? Because every act of God is righteous. Even when it feels like he's betrayed you. Even when it feels like it's painful. Even when it feels like, where are you, Lord? He promises to never leave us nor forsake us. He promises to always provide, provide for our needs. He promises to always lead us out. He promises to always be the truth. He promises to always be there with us. He promises, even when it feels like this is wrong, why would I lose my job? Why would I lose this? Why would this break? Why would that happen? All of God's acts are righteous. They're all right. They're never wrong. He doesn't do anything that is unrighteous. But a king will do some stuff that's unrighteous. He's going to make some decisions. Earthly leaders will make some unrighteous decisions. God never does. God will allow earthly leaders who make unrighteous decisions to be the ones leading you. And he uses that for good for those who love God and are called according to his purposes. He'll use an unrighteous act to use it in righteousness. And he takes what the devil means for bad and uses it for good in our lives. So he's testifying of all the righteous acts which the Lord did to you. Notice he did them to them and to their fathers. So what's he doing? He begins the testimony with Jacob. When Jacob had gone into Egypt, remember he went down there? He thought that Joseph was dead. He, there's a famine in the land, and they find out that Joseph's not dead, and he's number two in there, and he goes down there for 430 years. And your fathers cried out to the Lord. Then the Lord sent Moses and Aaron, who brought your fathers out of Egypt and made them dwell in this place. Think about that, verse 8. Verse 8 covers a span of years. How many years? 430 they were in Egypt. 40 years in the wilderness. So it covers a span of about 470 years, almost 500 years. And yet we got that whole testimony of God's righteous act in one verse. That's pretty amazing. But think about it. Down there, 430 years. Joseph was over them. It was great. They were living in the land of Goshen. They were separated from Egypt. They were able to live over there and do their own thing and serve God. And then all of a sudden, the people of Egypt, the, king, the Pharaoh changed, the Pharaoh changed, things changed. And now they're freaking out. They begin to oppress them and they make them slaves. And they begin to cry out to God. And when it was God's time, the fullness of the, or fullness of the uh, uh, Canaanites, when he was ready to punish them, 430 years, he heard their cry, and he raised up Moses. Moses said, I, I can't speak. Here I am, send Aaron. And he goes, all right, here comes your brother. We'll send Aaron with you. And then Moses still was the one who was drawn out to speak. And look what it says, who brought your fathers out of Egypt and made them dwell in this place. Now listen, when you see that word made, you got to be careful with it. They didn't go, you get over there right now. Because remember, they rebelled in the first generation, stayed in the wilderness and died. Everybody except for Joshua and Caleb died. All of them died. You got to look at this word really clearly. 
Made because it's a land of milk and honey. Made because it was a good choice. Made because they wanted to. When you say uh, uh, Psalms 23 and it says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. You know what that word means? It means he's so good and you see the goodness of the grass, the green pastures, that it makes you choose him and you don't want to do anything else. So when we see the goodness of God and we see that it's God who provides and that his provision is always righteous, his provision is always good, and his leaders are, are what he raised up for our lives, the troubles is what he has raised up for our lives, whatever it is in your life right now, God has allowed it to shape you that you need to see that it's good. And it should make you want to trust him more and more and more and cry out to him more and more and more. When we see the grace of God that he's given us, it should make us want to draw closer and closer to him and trust him more, not turn and say, give us a king. Give me something else to rule my life instead of the goodness of this God who makes me lie down in, in green pastures. I want something else. See, so when we want something else and we go after something else, we've forsaken God. When we chase something else and we have it in our hands and we're thinking it's going to make us happy, we've forsaken God. We put something else as king over our lives. And God will raise up a deliverer. Watch what he goes on to say here. Verse 9. And when they forgot the Lord their God. Notice that? That's what they've done. When they forgot the Lord their God, they were brought into a land of milk and honey. They were brought into a place that was so good that they wanted to dwell there. But then, because of the goodness of God, then because everything was done for them, they forgot the Lord their God. What did he do? Oh, he sold them into the hand of Sisera commander of the army of Hazor into the hand of the Philistines and into the hand of the king of Moab and they fought against them. Listen. Listen. They forgot God. And when you forget God, when you forget to trust Him, when you forget to look to Him and His provision, he will sell you to the enemy, into the hands of the enemy. But it's not to kill you. It's to deliver you. He allows the enemy to attack so that you'll cry out to him. And we're going to see that in a minute. See, they forget God. They become apostate. He sells them into the hand. When, when you don't have God's kingdom in your hand, you're his servanthood in your hand, when you don't have his word in your hand, when you don't have his things in your hand, you become sold into slavery to other things and you make them king. But God is allowing it because you forgot him. And he'll cause you to fight. Notice they fought against. Here it comes. It's the wrong things are in my hand and I'm fighting. I have this will in me that's fighting. The flesh is fighting the spirit. They're warring. And the thing that I want to do, I don't do. And the thing that I don't want to do, I do. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me? Who will save me? I thank my God for Jesus Christ. See, God is that deliverer. He allows the battle. He allows it so that he, you, will see as he raises up a deliverer and a savior, that he's the only one that can save us. He's the only power against the flesh. He's the only power against sin. His blood is the only thing. His gospel is the only thing that will deliver us. His provision is the only thing that can save us from the enemy. And he is the one who raised up Jesus Christ. He is the one that raised him up on a cross. He is the one who raised him up for our victory. He is the one who raised him from the grave for our justification. Our justification means that we would be just as if we never sinned. That's where our righteousness comes from. Our right standing comes from raising him up on a cross. Him spending three days in the grave and then raising him up from the grave. 
proves that his blood was received as an anointed sacrifice. But know that our souls were in sin and had a sin nature and had forgotten God. And we were sold in the bondage of sin to the devil. By Adam, the first Adam, he's the one sold us by rejecting God's word. And now we've been set free. Verse 10 says, Then, notice this, they forgot God. There was a battle. They were sold. And, and, and they fought. The battle was there so that they would cry out to God. They would remember who the Savior was, where the provision was from, who the King truly was, was God. Then they cried out to the Lord and said, we have sinned. They're repenting. They're confessing their sin. They're, for, they're confessing their forgetfulness of God's provision, of God being uh, Lord of their life, of trusting in God and believing in Him. How we need this type of confession in the kingdom of God today in the church is for people to remember that they have forgotten the God of their salvation. Because we have forsaken the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtoreths. The Baals were the male deities, Baals above. The Ashtoreths were the female deities. But now deliver us from the hand of our enemies and we will serve you. So they cried out to God. They confessed their sin. They, they admitted that they were apostate and had forsaken God and forgotten Him and were chasing their own lives as America, the American church is doing now. All of us are chasing the world and we need to confess that. We, we need to remember that we've forgotten the Word of God. We need to wake up from our sleep and confess it and cry out to God and remember that He has given us a mighty deliverer in Christ Jesus. And he'll deliver us from the hand of our enemies. So that we can do what? Serve him. And you know what? The nation of Israel promise after promise after promise. Deliver after deliver after deliver. And that's what you and I do. Well, not us. People in Texas. Well, maybe not people in Texas. But the church... Promise after promise, deliver me again, Lord, and I'll serve you. Deliver me, and I'll serve you. And he continues to allow us to fight these battles, so we will cry out to him and draw closer to him. It's not because he is mad at us. It's not because he's forsaken us. It's because he loves us. So know where your help comes from. Know who you're crying out to. Don't go to the world for help. Go to the throne room. Go to God's provision. He has raised up the God-man Jesus Christ. His blood is our provision. His cross is our salvation. His gospel is the power of God and the salvation. And this word is our instruction. And if we cease listening to correction, we will go astray just like the nation of Israel did and we have and we need to return and repent and ask him to help us have power to serve him and to do his work for his kingdom because one day they're going to witness against us of what our works were. Were they in faith for God or were our works for our own flesh for culturanity? Notice he's enumerating them here. Uh, verse 11. And the Lord sent. Notice he raised him up. And then he sent them. He sent us to the nations. We are one sent forth in a general sense. We are to go to all nations. We're to go and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And teach them to obey all that God has commanded us. All. Obey all. And he says, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He's with us. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. His spirit lives in us. He will anoint us. He will give us the words to say. Notice this. 
He raises them up. He sent Jeroboam. And that's Gideon. Bedan is probably Barak. Jephthah. Remember Jephthah? He made that crazy vow. Whatever comes out of my door when I get home, I'll sacrifice to you, Lord. And it was his daughter, his only daughter, he made this crazy vow. God had already anointed him to go and be the deliverer. And he had to make a crazy vow. All we have to do is go and do what God has called us to do. Repent and go and serve God. And trust in his strength and might. He's already delivered the world. All we have to do is go to him with the gospel and tell him. And then the other one is, it says Samuel. And then it's got an E by it. It's really probably Samson. There's some scribal probably error here in, in, in transcribing this. I believe that is Samson. The Syriac scrolls read Simpson or, or Sims, Simson, S-I-M-S-O-N. I think it's Samson because he's talking about the judges. Remember, the judges were saviors. They were deliverers. We went through the book of Judges. They kept going apostate. And, and then they would cry out to God because the enemy was attacking and they were fighting, fighting, fighting. He would raise up a deliverer. And it happened over and over and over. But every time they would come back to God, every time the deliverer would deliver them, they would be further and further away from the morality of God, further and further away from the commandment of God, further and further away from the law of God and the ways of God. And they would trust him even less until finally they go into 70 years of captivity because they were not keeping the instruction of God or the commandment of God. So he raises up these deliverers and delivered you out of the hand of your enemies on every side and you dwelt safely. And that's really what salvation is about, is being delivered from the sin nature, being delivered so we can dwell safely in God's presence we can be safe and sound and know that in our anointing, we can go tell people the truth. We can go tell people the gospel. And we can go stand before anybody in the love of Christ for the, uh, uh, for the power of God and for the kingdom of God and be his ambassadors as if God was pleading through us, be reconciled to God. That's what he's called us to do. And we can dwell in safety. Does that mean that we won't get killed? Does that mean we won't get beaten? Does that mean we won't get shipwrecked or whatever some of the things that happened with Paul? Does that mean that they won't kill us? Of course not. But our soul is safe with God. And it will dwell safely forever. That's what Psalms 23 says. And I will dwell in the presence of the Lord forever. See, when we see his goodness as his sheep and he's our shepherd and he's leading us and we can trust him and he's got all righteous acts for us. And he makes us to lie down in his will, in his place, in his provision. In Christ is where we need to be. That's exactly what we need to say to people. Instead of, did you say a prayer? Did you get saved? Do you believe in Jesus? We need to say, are you in Christ? Because we need to be in Christ. We need to be in the Messiah, in his will. We need to be growing in the Messiah. He needs to be in us and we need to be in him. John 15, 5 says, I am the vine and you are the branches. And if a man abide in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. Somebody get a calculator. You got a calculator? No. Let's add that up and see what nothing is. See, it's us in Christ and Christ in us. There's this intimate relationship of love where we're trusting him because he's trustworthy. We're obeying him because all of his acts are righteous and he's got good plans for us. He loves us with a never-ending love. And even when there's an enemy attacking, even when there's a battle in your life right now, think about it. Is there a battle in your life right now? Are you fighting with sin? Are you struggling with the besetting sin? Are you fighting against finances or something? There's something, an attitude, I'm mad at them, they're mad at me. 
It's because we're not trusting God and, and in His hand and doing the things that He's called us to do. We're not looking at it from a heavenly perspective. We're looking at it from a physical perspective. We're not looking at it through the Spirit of God. We're looking at it through physical eyes that they've done to me and I don't like it. We're not looking at it through God's provision and knowing that it's going to lead to righteousness if we let it train us in the way to go as children of God. And that he delivered them on every side. And when you saw that Nahash, king of the Ammonites, came against you, you said to me, remember Nahash meant serpent and snake, but you said to me, no, but a king shall reign over us when the Lord your God was your king. Now, that verse right there is, is, is almost out of place to me. And the way that it is spoken, it almost tells us that Nahash came and Samuel's sons were ruling over them and they didn't like it and Samuel's son wasn't willing to help. And so almost in the fact that there was an enemy attacking, they needed a leader. So they said, well, your kids ain't doing it, so we need a king to go out and fight before us. And it kind of gives us another story of what happened in these other chapters. That one line there could give us a lot of background to what was going on. And maybe they ask in those seven days for earthly government to rule over them. You know that right now that's what's going on on the planet. Instead of us believing in Jesus, even in the church, we're looking to earthly government. We're looking to earthly kings. And we think that they can save us, and they cannot. But he's going to give us some counsel for that here in a second. So they asked for a king. Because the snake, the serpent, attacked them. What would you ask for when the serpent attacks? Eve had a conversation with the serpent and listened to him. She didn't ask her husband. She didn't ask God. Nope. Think about this for a minute. When a snake attacks, when the serpent comes, we want to cry out to Jesus, not to man, not to an earthly king. We want to cry out to Jesus. 13, now therefore, here is the king whom you have chosen and whom you have desired. The word desired there means you have selected or you have asked for. You have requested. Here he is. Again, it's almost as if he's saying, here he is right before you. You chose him because God chose him because of their hearts. And take note, the Lord has sent a king over you. So God gave them. Remember, God gave them the desires of their heart. They requested it. But he brought leanness to their soul. It brings leanness to your soul when you let something else go in your hand before God. And now we have this earthly king, this earthly government. See, we do not want something else to come between us and our God. Because it brings leanness to your soul. But God's grace is sufficient. Look what he says in 14. You've got your desire. God has brought you a king, an earthly king. But if you fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice. In Hebrews it says, today if you will hear his voice and do not rebel or harden your heart as you did, in, as the children of Israel did in the wilderness. Today if you'll hear his voice and do not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then both of you, the king, and the king who reigns over you will continue following the Lord your God. So what is he saying? God, I'm going to give grace. Here's grace. God's given you a king, but you need to still listen to God, hear his voice, obey his commandments, and so does the king. I will allow this structure of government on the earth and before you, but you still need to... Hear my voice and obey it. And don't rebel against my commandments. See, the commandments of the Lord are not burdensome. They're good for us. 
I know some people go, well, we're not under commandments. That word really means instruction. And reproof of instruction is the way of life. The commandment is the law, and the word is a light, but reproof of instruction is the way of life. Proverbs 6, 23. Are you listening to hear the voice of God? My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Revelation 3 and 20. Listen to me. His word is his voice. And he speaks through his word. He speaks through his voice. His spirit will lead you with unction. Using your own intellect, he will speak to you and give you wisdom in what to do. But don't rebel. The word obey here means to hear intellectually. That's what the word obey means here. Isn't it amazing? I never knew that that's what obey means. To hear intellectually. Or excuse me. To hear intelligently. With attention and obedience. That's what hear means. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So when I hear intelligently the word of God. And I give attention to it. I pay heed and I obey it. Then my faith grows. I'm hearing the voice of God. I'm obeying and I'm not rebelling. I didn't know this, but the word rebel means is Mara. Remember Mara? Remember in Ruth, Ruth said, don't call me, or excuse me, Naomi said, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara. Because she was bitter. It's a word for bitter or unpleasant, but it's also the word you use for rebel in the, in the Hebrew language. It means to resist or be disobedient to God's voice. So, we hear the word of God. We hear the voice of God. But we rebel against it and do what we want to do. We're disobedient. And he says, if you fear the Lord. You know, the fear of the Lord is to hate all evil, pride, arrogance, and the evil way I hate. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's the beginning of knowing Christ and the way of life. Is to fear God. And we don't fear him like he's going to reach down and smack us, we fill him with reverence. We fear him, and our fear changes as we grow in the word of God and in our relationship with God. We fear that we would hurt the heart of God. And fear is really grounded in obedience. In, in Genesis 22, when Abraham took Isaac up and was going to sacrifice him to God, Christ often, he, Christ called to him and said, Abraham, don't lay a hand on the boy, for now I know that you fear God. See, he was in his obedience of God's word. He heard God's voice and said, go sacrifice the boy on Mount Moriah. He went to do it, and he just said, I'm doing it. And he reckoned in his heart that God would raise the boy from the dead. And it was a type of Christ. But he had, and he said, now I know you fear God. Because without understanding, without knowing what God was doing, just knowing that God's works are righteous acts always, and his ways are always good for us, he heard the voice of God, he knew the word of God, he obeyed it, and God said, now I know you fear me. So fear of God is wrapped up in obedience to God. In fact, our faith is proven out by obedience to God. If we really trust God, we'll obey him, and do things that we don't even know how to do. We'll trust him and walk by faith if we fear him. So he says if the people will do that and hear his voice and not rebel. Then both you and the king who reigns over you will continue following the Lord your God. So think about that. There's an earthly government. That is rebelling against God. There's an earthly church that's rebelling against their God. So what are we following then? We're not continuing to follow the Lord our God unless we're listening to his voice. Unless we're uh, 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 fearing him and serving him and doing his work. 15. However, he makes this contrast. 
If you do not obey the voice of the Lord, that would be disobedient, that would be rebellion, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you as it was against your fathers. That's scary. That's scary. We do not want the hand of a loving God who gave his only son to save us against us because he's going to bring justice upon us. He's a just God also. But notice he says, he gives us the example, as it was against your fathers. Remember, they would not listen. They wouldn't go into the land. They said, oh, there's giants there. We don't trust you, God. It's a land of milk and honey, but there's giants there. And they all died in the wilderness because they hardened their heart. They heard, but they didn't mix it with faith. Faith is grounded in obedience. Faith is grown in obedience. Faith is, 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 is the seedbed of how we grow, but it's as, as we obey, they grow together. They didn't mix it with faith. Are you mixing the word that you've heard, the commandment you've heard, the voice you've heard with faith? As you obey God, it will grow your faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. They didn't mix it with it and they all died. They, God was against them. And they, he said and he swore and he would not relent. You will not enter into my rest. And then, you know, of course, Hebrews tells us there's still a rest for you and I. And Christ is our rest. He's our hope of glory. But it's Christ in us that's the hope of glory. So we do not ever want the hand of God against us. We want to be with God, following God, hearing the voice of God, surrendering to God, confessing our sin to God. And part of confessing your sin... Uh, or excuse me, part of obeying God is confessing your sin and allowing to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. He's washing us. Now therefore, verse 16, now therefore stand and see this great thing which the Lord will do before your eyes. Notice this. It wasn't as if they were all sitting down. You know, we do that in our church today. We, the teacher stands and all the people sat. But in those days, he would sit down and everybody else would be standing. So when he says, now therefore stand, he's talking about our position. He's talking about us trusting God. Stand in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. Stand in the place that you are and believe in God and fear God and serve God and obey his voice. That's how you stand, is you stand in the victory that's already been wrought. You stand in the promise and the provision and the power of God. That's how we stand. And see the great things which the Lord will do before your eyes. Is today not the wheat harvest? I will call to the Lord. So Samuel's going to pray. And he will send thunder and rain that you may perceive and see that your wickedness is great. Which you have done in the sight of the Lord in asking a king for yourself. See they rejected God. But God is giving grace to his own children here, the nation of Israel. And he says, so I'm going to cry out to God, and he's going to send thunder, and he's going to send rain. That's scary. So look at 18. So Samuel called to the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day. See, they just wanted rain for their crops. It was, it, it was the weed harvest. Actually, their crops were already grown probably, so they probably didn't want rain. So thunder and rain probably was a bad thing both together because they would get the monsoons that would wash out their crops. And all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. Notice who they feared? The Lord and Samuel. It wasn't feared Samuel and the Lord. See, today I think in the church a lot of times we fear the pastor or the Bible study leader or the preacher before we fear God. We fear the rules that man has made up. We fear the traditions. We fear the church movement instead of fearing God. And we obey the voice of the church movement, but not the word of God. And it's backward. It's God first, then man. And if we fear God first and we speak the word of God, then God will bless it. But notice what he did. 
he sent this thunder and this rain. Remember what he did in chapter 7 when he was, they obeyed and he was showing them that their repentance was good? He defeated the Philistines with thunder. He caused confusion. It was chapter 7, remember? He sent that great thunder. They got confused and, they, and, and he defeated them all by himself. They didn't even have to fight. They started chasing him afterwards and killed him and received the plunder. Now he brought it on them and freaked them out because he, he knew they knew what God could do with this. And it created fear of the Lord and of Samuel. And all the people said to Samuel, pray for your servants to the Lord, your God. Notice they still don't have this as possession of their God. Is God your God? Is it a personal God? Are you trusting your God? Are you standing and obeying and hearing his voice? Is he your personal God that died for you? Is he your provision? That we may not die. For we have added to our sins the evil of asking a king for ourselves. Think about it. We had a sin nature. And then we add to it by letting something else be king of our lives. And he says, pray for us. And that's really where we need to be is praying Spending time with God. And we're going to get to that in a minute. Then Samuel said to the people, Do not fear. You have done all this wickedness. Yet do not turn aside from following the Lord. But serve the Lord with all your heart. Listen. God is giving grace. God is forgiving your sin. Don't cease following him. Stay in the way with him. Let him work it out no matter what the battle is. He's cleansing you. He's washing you. God forbid that it would not be permission to, to sin, but it's, it's saying the devil wants to get you out of the race. And we want to stay in the hand of God and keep our hands before God and don't get into the hand of the enemy by forsaking God or forgetting God. Cry out to God in the battle. Then Samuel said to the people, excuse me, verse 21, and do not turn aside for then you would go after empty things which cannot profit or deliver for they are nothing. And that's really what a lot of people are doing today. They're going after empty idols. They don't deliver empty religion, empty tradition, the fables and the stories and they're not pursuing God. They're not looking to God and crying out to God and trusting God. We're not having a relationship with him and reading his word and trusting him and walking according to his provision. We're following our own ways. For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake because it has pleased the Lord to make you his people. He gave his most prized possession. Will he not give us everything we need for life and godliness? Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you, but I will teach you the good and the right way. Listen, listen. Is it sin against God to not pray? It's an interesting statement. Is it sin against God not to pray for other people? Listen, Jesus said, my house should be a house of prayer. We are supposed to pray. Are you praying? Are you building that love relationship? Are you building that dependency upon God by bringing all things to God in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, making your request known to God, and the peace of God will guard your heart and mind through Christ Jesus? Pray. Pray, and the word of God will teach you the good and right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart, not part of your heart, not a divided heart, not an evil heart, but all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, for consider what great things he has done for you. And isn't that what he's doing? He's given the testimony of God, the deliverance of God, the, the provision of God. He's talking about all the times they were in trouble and God delivered them when they cried out. Consider that in your heart. Consider what God has done, the great things he's already done for us. But if you still do wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and your king. If they live wickedly as a nation, if they live wickedly as a people, you can be swept away in a tide, 
swept away in a flood of evil. That's what happens. If you don't if you don't surrender your life, it's not just the prayer, it's surrendering your life completely, coming dependently as little children and begin to follow the instruction, obey the commands, walk in His way, learn to be obedient and hear His voice. And part of that is confessing when we're not. Part of that is saying, Oh Lord, wretched man that I am. Listen, if you don't build this love relationship and you continue just to walk wickedly with your heart, you will be swept away in a flood of evil. The only way to be delivered from this flood of evil is to walk humbly before your God. To bow down before Him. I fear that our nation is going to be swept away. I fear that our nation has already been swept away. We're putting Islam in all the schools. We're putting communism and socialism in all the schools. We're training the next generation to live ungodly lives that believe in evolution and not a God who saved them. They're looking to man's provision and government's provision instead of God's provision. They're looking to earthly kingdoms instead of God's kingdom. We're looking at physical, tangible, instead of understanding there's a spiritual kingdom. There's a spiritual realm with demons that are causing these shootings. It's not a gun that kills people. It's a demon that gets a hold of a kid. It's not a sickness. It's a demon. It's evil on the planet. It's a flood that we're being carried away with when we don't train our children in truth of righteousness, when we obey the government and their indoctrination stations instead of a God who loved us enough to give His Son and spill His blood to save us from this flood of evil. And I fear that we're being carried away, and so is all of our kings, except for King Jesus. And I hope soon that we obey God, live for God, and we'll get carried away in the rapture to be with him forever because it's coming soon and very soon we're going to see the king I pray that we'll be snatched away by the Lord and not be swept away by a flood of evil Amen, Amen. Father wake us up at the heart of our Christian walk pour out your spirit upon us Give us a desire to obey, to hear your voice, and not to rebel or harden our heart as in the day of rebellion. But Lord, give us a desire to follow after you, to draw near to you, to trust in all of your righteous acts, and to repent and serve you in spirit and truth. We give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen.